there's two things I love to do. I love to read a story about Jesus, and I love to read a fishing story. And we've got a wonderful blessing today because we're going to read about both. Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 5, verse, 11, uh, verse 1 through 11. And we're going to talk about the miraculous catch of fish. I don't know how many of you are fishermen, uh, fisher ladies, but uh, it's something that I've enjoyed doing ever since I was a little boy and learned how to do it. It's a, a wonderful thing to do. But there's a lot of lessons that you can learn uh, from the art and the sport of fishing especially as it relates to how Jesus helped these people to catch a great deal of fish through his miraculous power. Now, this particular story, uh, it's a fishing story, but it's not about the fishing. It's about spiritual truth. The fishing is a backdrop. Uh, it's the, uh, the, the vehicle that the truths are brought in. Uh, but let's understand something today, that the Lord uh, Jesus, when he was on earth, he grew up as a carpenter. So it's going to be an interesting thing today. We're going to see some fishermen taking fishing advice from a carpenter. Because he's not only a carpenter, he's the Lord of glory. And so let's open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 5, verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing in the lake. But the fishermen, fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. So we see here that Jesus comes to the shore, and they let him use his ship as a pulpit to teach the people on the shore. So that's their uh, acquaintance with Christ. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had, they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so it also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to grasp the meaning of this great passage of Scripture and make application as your Holy Spirit would bring to our hearts, Lord, so that we may be better Christians and our church may be a stronger church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Gospels represent Jesus, the Son of God, and also the carpenter from Nazareth. And many knew him as that before they knew him as Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Jesus was not speaking to them as a fellow fisherman. He was speaking to them uh, not as an expert in the mig migratory habits of aquatic life. He was speaking to them as their Savior. And so he met them where they were. Who were these men? Well, they were fishermen. That's who they were. So Jesus entered into their world where they lived, he got into the boat with them, and he led them toward a greater life, a greater understanding. Now, because Jesus was God in the flesh, he, he was Lord over all creation. Now, he could make a bunch of fish appear out of nowhere. I think it's interesting that God also has the ability to make fish disappear entirely. Think about fishing all night long and catching nothing. I, I think God had something to do with that, too. Because it's hard for professionals to fish all night and not catch anything. But yet that was what they were going. That was almost miraculous of itself. But here we have uh, that we see the Lord preparing them for service. And so uh, Jesus is the leading expert of field in every study. Uh, he can create it or he can make it be still. Uh, he can manage a life itself uh, in his power. Now, I want to direct your attention to a slide that, that I have found interesting. This is a, about an author named uh, Harry Anderson. 
When I was uh, a church planter in Mobile, I hadn't been there very long. Uh, I had to rent a house uh, to live in, and so we found a modest brick home, and uh, we rented it. Well, the man who was our realtor, the the landlord, was a man named Chet Russell. And Chet Russell was a churchman. He was a good Baptist layman, uh, a a fine Christian gentleman. And uh, he gave us this uh, place to stay, and we paid him a fair uh, rent. And uh, when I went in his office to talk with him, this is the picture he had hanging on his wall. And you see it as a representation of Jesus giving advice to a businessman. And I love this picture because you see the businessman, he's listening. Uh, He's listening to Jesus talk to him, and I can presume about business, but also perhaps about spiritual things. Now, when I saw this picture, it had a great effect upon me because I knew that this was a man who listened to Jesus, and he valued that. So when it came time for me to try to buy a home, I went to this man, and I made an offer that I would buy the home, but I didn't have any down payment. And so he set me up with what was typically done at that time, a, a vendor's lien, and so we started paying more per rent, but to buy instead. So it was like a rent-to-own situation at an interest rate. And he took a chance on me, and I'm a homeowner today because of the kindness and the fairness and the equity of that Christian businessman, because he listened to Jesus. He took Jesus into his office, and he gave a young church planter a chance uh, to buy his first home. I never will forget that. But what I want to talk to you about now is seven points about this particular story. The first one be consideration. Consideration. Now understand something, that Jesus had already presented himself as more than a carpenter. He was teaching and preaching along the banks. So they knew him as a rabbi, they knew him as a teacher. And so he had finished his sermon, and he said, uh, fellas, launch out and drop your nets. And now, now you've got to understand, the, the consideration is this. Peter allowed Jesus to occupy his boat. Now listen, if you have a boat, it's good to let Jesus in your boat. If you have a house, it's good to let Jesus in your house. If you have a business, it's good to let Jesus into your business. Uh, if you have a hobby, it's good to let Jesus into your hobby. When Jesus comes into your life, whatever aspect of your life there is, there's going to be an improvement. Uh, there's going to be an augmentation. There's going to be a blessing associated with that. And so Jesus' wisdom, Jesus' power came into the boat. Uh, And so he listened to Jesus and he considered what he said. Now, there was a a command here that Jesus, when invited, will always take over. Let's understand something. When Jesus comes into your life, he will take over. Now, he will do so gently. He will do so in a way that you're able to respond to. He will not be harsh. He will not be tyrannical. He will not be unkind. But he firmly will be Lord. He occupies that position. And when you, when you ask Jesus to come into your boat, the Lord is in your boat. When you ask Jesus to come into your business, the Lord is in your business. Listen, when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, to your life, the Lord is in your life. That is, he will take control. Jesus knows that his way is better than your way. Jesus knows that his plan is better than your plan. Uh, You know, when you're young, you usually have a plan for your life. My plan changed. When I was very young, my plan was to become a pirate. I thought they were really cool. I thought it'd be great to sail on one of those old ships and have a sword and go people and fight people and, and uh, take treasure and, and have a party. And that's how my mind operated. I'd see these movies. Oh, those pirates look like they're having a lot of fun. Well, pretty soon I began to realize that those fellows were criminals and most of them died terrible deaths. And so I changed my plan. And so I began to look around. What, what would be the plan for my life? And I, I looked and, you know, in the, in the neighborhood in which I lived, uh, there were a lot of retirees. I didn't see a lot of activity. But I could walk downtown as just a barefoot boy in Alabama, uh, in Mobile, and I could go downtown and, and they would have construction sites. And they would have these walls up with boards over them so you couldn't see the construction site. But every so often they would have a hole where you could look through. And I would get a peach crate or a soapbox or something. I could as a little boy and I would get up and I would look through there. 
And I would watch all those working men with their hard hats on and climbing rigs and doing those things like pirates did, except they weren't fighting and they weren't getting killed. And I thought, I'd like to be one of those. I'd like to work. I wanted to be a working man. I want to be a carpenter. I want to cut wood and build things. And I would watch them and they'd build them. And I said, wow, that's, that's really cool. I'd love to do that. And I had a plan for my life. And then I, when I got a little older, I learned about sports. And I'd go to the, the park and I'd watch the big boys play ball. And I'd watch them bat and I'd watch them run and I'd watch them throw. And, and they were having a good time. And I said, I'd like to do that too. And I had a plan for my life. Well, then when I was a teenage boy, the Lord Jesus became Lord of my life, and He took my plans a different direction. And He said, I want you to be a pastor. I want you to preach the gospel. And so I put the whole baseball thing off. I put the whole construction thing off to focus on that. But then here's, here's what's interesting. In my ministry, which has largely been bivocational, God let me be a carpenter, and maybe not baseball, but softball. Now, what I'm saying is, maybe your plan is good, but it needs Jesus in it. Maybe your plan, the plan to be a pirate, <laughs> was bad, and Jesus will reveal that to you. Listen, there's some things we try to do that we shouldn't even be involved with. God will say no. He will be Lord. He'll give us a command. He'll say no. Other times, He will guide. He will guide it to where it comes to the best good. So, listen, Peter was under no obligation to follow Christ's command. However, failing to do so would have caused Peter to miss out on the great blessing that came. He could have said, no, I'm not going out. No, I'm tired. But he obeyed, and great things came of it. So people do not, you know, most people do not like the idea of a Jesus who insists he's right. But he is. A lot of people today want a Jesus that will not tell them what to do. But he will. When you think about it, you're here today to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, but you're also here to learn about how you should think and how you should live. And we all, if we're sincere Christians, come to the Lord Jesus to learn, what can I do? Lincoln was not a big churchgoer, but he did admire a good sermon, and he would listen to sermons. One man preached a sermon, and he asked President Lincoln, what did you think of the sermon? He said, well, it was a, a good sermon, but it wasn't a great sermon. Well, the man was curious. Well, sir, what, what, what would have made it a great sermon? And he said, if you had given us something to do. Well, I think he has it right there. Uh, all sermons should ultimately come to a, a, a point where we find something to do for the Lord Jesus Christ, to improve, to increase. Now, let's understand something. There's another point found in here, and I believe this is a factor, and it's a real factor, and it's cynicism. Cynicism. The first thought that Peter had was, I'm fixing to waste my time. That was what he was thinking. He'd already spent all night fishing and nothing. And he said, we fished all night and caught nothing. He said that. You know why he said it? Because it was true. He said it because he wanted the Lord to know, well, you know, I've been out there all night. Ah, nevertheless, at thy word. You see, there was a little bit of skepticism involved in that. It's kind of like the man who asked Jesus to, to cast the demon out of his son. And Jesus said, if you believe, all things are possible. And he said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. There was some doubt. Most of us, if we're honest we'll have to admit that even in the times that we're exhibiting faith, there's always a little doubt mixed with it. There's always a little bit of, hmm, I wonder. Now, I'll demonstrate how that's true. When you pray to God for a miracle, and sometimes God does really come through in miraculous fashion, it's wonderful. We get happy, we get excited, we say, wow, I prayed this and God answered, praise the Lord. Well, listen, if you had 100% faith, you'd just say, yeah, that's what I asked for, it's what I got. But it's a big deal because there was always that little bit, I wonder if he'll do it. I wonder if he'll actually do it the way I asked. Listen, uh, there was some cynicism believed in this, uh, involved in this. Listen, when you've done something over and over and over and over again and nothing came from it, pretty soon you kind of lose the enthusiasm to do that thing. When you have worked and worked and worked and invested and invested and invested in something to happen and it didn't happen, 
it's not hard to understand that you might get to a point where you say, well, I'm not going to do that again. Well, that's where they were all night long. Now, I know what it's like to fish all night long and catch nothing. It is almost like you're, 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 you're thinking, Lord, where are the fish? I know they're in here somewhere. I know they're catchable because I've heard that people do catch fish in this body of water, and yet I'm not catching anything. That's where you are. It's tough. Now, how'd you like to be a professional fisherman with other professional fishermen, and your livelihood depends on you catching fish and fish all night and catch nothing? Well, that's where Peter was. And that is why we see there is some degree of cynicism. Now, I I make a point of this to say this. Uh, God knows how we think. He knows we can get discouraged. He knows that we're sometimes going to be hesitant to obey. But he did obey. We come to compliance now. Nevertheless, nevertheless, even though I have my doubts, even though I'm tired from having thrown the net all night long and taken nothing, even though I have not much faith that anything's going to come from this, because you asked me to, I will do it. Nevertheless, that's compliance. And you know, sometimes that's all God wants you to do. Just to say, I'll give it one more try. I'll give it one more try. I'll see what I can do since you asked me to do this. Peter's like you and me. He was initially reluctant, but then he complied. Sometimes that's the way salvation is, isn't it? The Lord Jesus convicts your heart of your sin and your need for the Savior, and uh, more often than not, a person's initial response would be, "Mm, I don't know. There's a little bit of hesitancy there, a little bit of skepticism, a little bit of wrestling there. Very few times do people come to the Lord just as soon as the gospel is presented to them. Usually there's a struggle of some type, and then it ends in compliance. But then we come to the happy part of this, and that is compensation. Fish success. Now, when, you're, when you go fishing, here's how you determine success. You catch fish. How do you define failure? You don't catch fish. So Jesus gave these men success. He made them winners by his supernatural power. Now listen, I, I think the reason God let them fish all night and catch nothing so that the contrast would be there. This is how you do in the flesh. This is how you do when Jesus is in your boat. And the fish just came out of nowhere. I mean, they're just piling in. And there was a great compensation. Listen, trusting Christ will bring blessings to your life. You ask Jesus in your boat, your boat's going to be a better boat. You ask Jesus in your house, your house is going to be a better house. Your business is going to be a better business. Doing things the way God would have us do them makes us partners in the doings of God. Now, Jesus took over Peter's fishing business, and he made it more of a success. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about the prosperity gospel. There's a truth that if taken to excess becomes a heresy, it becomes an error. It is true that through the power of God in your life, you can have more success. You can do better. Listen, if you were a secretary before you got saved, You will be a better secretary after you get saved if you follow the Lord. He'll make you better at that job. If you were a teacher before you were saved, you will be a better teacher after you're saved. The same is true with every profession and every trade. Uh, Listen, if you were a retiree before you got saved, you get saved, you'll become a better retiree. Uh, There's nothing that Christ can't make better. And so here we have compensation. But now... Following Christ doesn't guarantee you'll be wealthy. Uh, Trusting Christ doesn't mean that you'll even have all the things you think you want or all the things you think you need. Sometimes you may have hardship. Sometimes you may have difficulty. You look in the Word of God, and and the people that God worked through the most often went through times of uh, 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 where things were down, when things were short of supply. But now that being said, there is the truth. You let Jesus in your boat, you're going to have a better boat. You let Jesus in your life, you're going to have a better life. I can say without any question in my personal life that I am doing better in every measurable category of living because of Jesus Christ. 
I'm a better husband because of Jesus. I'm a better father because of Jesus. I'm a better tradesman because of Jesus. I, I believe I'm a better person because of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to be wealthy. It doesn't mean I'm going to be high up or somewhere. But it does mean I'm going to be better than I was before. So that's true. Then we have cooperation. We can't miss this. This is in here on purpose. There was a great harvest of fish. Their net was breaking. And so they come partners. James and John and others, they, they, they were partners. They were all in it together. They shared nets. They shared a boat. They shared a business. And said, so come and help us. The harvest is more than we can do. And so here's what they did. They connected with others. Imagine that. Connecting with others in the overall work of catching fish. Well, that's what every church is supposed to do, to partner with other people, to partner with others. That's why we have our missionaries, and that's why we publish their letters, because, listen, we are connected to every missionary that goes out and does work for God, and if we pray for them and support them and help them, that we are all together in that great work. It's important to understand that. Cooperation. Our blessings are to be shared with the community at large, and the blessings of others uh, we can share in as well. The more faith in Christ and the truer that faith becomes, the more blessings there will be. The more we are connected with others who are doing the work of God, the more blessings we'll be able to share in. You know, when it talks about cooperation, that we have a cooperation between the church and community, between the church and the state. Our founding fathers understood this. Our founding fathers understood that Christianity is good for this country. Christianity is good for the community. The teachings and preachings of the gospel and the truths found in the Holy Bible made this country a better country. It made its people better people. And you didn't have to have quite as many police officers. You didn't have to have quite as many jails. You didn't have to have quite as much uh, uh, money spent on managing uh, disasters if Christians were doing what they were supposed to do. You know the best thing you can do for a community? is give the men something better to do than be plunderers. Because if you don't give a man something good to do, he'll find something bad to do. If you don't make a man a loving husband and father, he's liable to find another career that's not quite as admirable. Listen, God knows this. And the founding fathers knew this. And there's one thing that Christianity does. It helps us to manage that old nature and focus our energies on the truths of Christ and being decent human beings, and a country benefits from that. And you know what's wrong with our country today? We have left those principles. We have left those principles, and now we have chaos reigning in our society. Listen, we need to have more cooperation between the church and the state. Now, now we're not here to rule, but we are here to influence. And listen, the state should listen to what preachers have to say instead of dismissing what they have to say. Uh, we should have the ears of those who are in power. Well, then we come to that point in this narrative where Peter looks at these fish, and listen, he knows this is a miracle. He knows he didn't all of a sudden become just a better fisherman. He didn't say, wow, I got lucky this time. You know, he knew this was this man. At this man's word, I went one more time. At this man's word, I let down my nets when I was skeptical. And this miraculous draw of fishes came, and he knew it was a miracle. And now he has contrition. He realizes, wow, I'm in the presence of the supernatural here. I am in the presence of a holy man. I am in the presence of someone special. And he expresses his unworthiness as a sinner. Listen, when, he, when it says he came down to Jesus' knees, Peter got on his knees before Jesus. That's an act of contrition. It's an act of worship. And he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Listen, he, he felt convicted just being in the presence of this holy man, Jesus Christ. Listen, that should be a part of every genuine encounter with Jesus Christ. Listen, you, you can't come to God without some sense of contrition. You look through all the Old Testament when God revealed himself to men. The first thing they would do is fall on their face. They would say, I'm a man of unclean lips. or They'd feel unworthy. I'm a worm and no man. I'm a child and, and not a man. Uh, they would always see themselves as vile. Job, 
the one that God called the most righteous man in all the earth, when God appeared to him in the whirlwind, he said, I, I lay my hand upon my mouth and I repent in dust and ashes. I'm a worm and no man. Listen, when we come to Christ and we understand his power, we will be convicted of our lack of righteousness, but we won't just stay there. there there's somewhere Jesus wants to bring us. Listen, if, if Jesus brings us to contrition, it's to forgive us and, and give us his grace. Uh, so God's not in the business of just, let's see how many people I can make miserable today. Do you think that's how God is? He's up in heaven rubbing his fingers and saying, oh boy, he'll have a hard time sleeping tonight with that one. Oh boy, look at him. Yeah, he'll be miserable for days. Boom, got him. No, God's not cruel. Uh, it's no more cruel than a doctor would be when you come to him for diagnosis. You want him to tell you the truth. And if there's something wrong with you, he'll tell you. He doesn't take delight in it. He doesn't go home and say, man, I really got him with that one. That diagnosis will be with him for years. No, he told you the truth because he wants to help you get better. Now, Jesus is the great physician. And at any time, he should be able to look at you and look at me and find fault. <laughs> and listen, it's not a, it doesn't take long a search. Amen? When the Lord looks into our hearts, it doesn't take long for him to find something we need to reckon with, something we need to deal with. There was contrition. When we stand in awe of Christ's holiness and we're aware of our own unworthiness, then we're getting closer to righteousness. When we think we're doing pretty good, we need to get back in our prayer closet. When we get to thinking we're doing pretty all right, we need to get on our knees before God. Then there was this commission. Jesus said, okay, you're, you're a fisherman. I'm going to make you fishers of men. Now, this was a commission, a commission. Jesus said, I'm going to change your life. I'm going to change your focus. Now, did Peter forget everything he knew about fishing when he became a follower of Jesus? No. He was still a fisherman. He was Simon the fisherman. Jesus still knew how to do carpentry work. All these men still knew what to do. They still knew who they were. Later, we see Peter fishing again. So he didn't fish. But, but now his focus is different. That uh, show that many of you have seen called The Chosen. It's a popular show. It's on streaming. Many of you have seen it. I've seen it. And while I don't believe it's accurate, and while a lot of stuff is added in, I do, I do like the drama. I do like the effect. I do like one scene they showed of Peter going to explain to his wife he's going to leave the fishing business. He's going to follow this teacher. You try that to your wife. You just go home and say, well, hon, I'm, I'm going to quit the job and I'm going to go out and just follow this man around. Which man? Well, that teacher, you know, the one, the rabbi, the one that some people theorize might be the Messiah is him. Well, how are we going to pay the rent? I don't know. How are we going to pay the bills? I don't know. God will provide. Listen, it takes a spiritual woman to hear something like that and sign off on it. And of course, it's all made up. It's imaginary. But some scene like that had to go on for Simon to be able to leave his fishing business and go follow Jesus. And I believe all their needs were met. I believe God did take care of them, but it took faith to do it, did it not? There had to be some contrition. There had to be a commission then. For many are called, but few are chosen. Listen. His plan for your life is better than your plan. We can get bitter or we can get better. Now, bitter can come quickly. Better takes more time. All you have to do to be bitter is say no to God's plan for your life and bitterness will come into your life because you're never going to be happy outside of God's will. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you become a millionaire. I don't care if everybody loves you. If you are out of God's will in your life, you're not going to be content. You're not going to be happy. You're not going to be at peace. So there is this commission. What is God asking you to do? Who is God leading you to be? That's important. And that's where your blessings are. That's where your happiness will be met. There's a Christian author named James Stewart, not the actor. But he said this, it's a little poem, what God claims, I yield. What I yield, God accepts. What God accepts, he fills. 
And what God fills, He uses. Isn't that beautiful? That's commission. Listen, when God takes you, He takes you for the better. When God calls you and commissions you, it's a better life than you would have ever had before. But then there has to be one last thing that has to take place, and that's commitment. Commitment. You see, the Bible says they left all and followed him. You see, the commission can be given. God gives the commission. But you have got to comply. You have got to commit. You have got to say, I will obey. I will follow you. That is the final step in this whole series of events. This basically is a story about the calling of Simon Peter and the other disciples. It's set in the backdrop of a fishing story. But it could have been any trade. It could have been anything. Let's say they were shepherds and maybe the sheep were being attacked by wolves and Jesus could have helped them uh, make the wolves go away. And we see all these other instances. It could have been uh, that their, their business could have been some other business and God would have used that. It just happened to be this. But I think it's important that God chose this because fishing in the Bible is a metaphor for evangelism. It's a metaphor for bringing others into the faith. They, they bring them out and they bring them here. And that's, Jesus said, I'll have you catch men. So we are all to be in some way or another involved in the overall winning of people to Jesus Christ. Jesus wants to be in your boat. We all have a boat. We all have that part of our lives that we're focused on for making a living, for enjoying life, that gives us meaning, that gives us purpose, that defines us. Whatever that is, let's just call that your boat. Jesus makes your boat better. Jesus makes your boat more successful. Jesus makes your boat a better boat than it ever would have been without him. He's called the Lord Jesus because he is the Lord Jesus. And when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we accept one who will come in and begin to make changes as changes need to be made. And you know, it is a lifelong process, is it not? I don't think any of us would be so bold if I were to ask, how many of you today have walked with the Lord long enough and served the Lord and been faithful so that now you've reached a complete state of absolute perfection? Raise your hand. Only an insane person would do so. The story is told about a preacher who made a statement like that that said, does, does anybody hear a perfect? And a man stood up and he said, sir, I don't think you understood the question. I asked the question, does anybody hear perfect? And he said, no, I'm not talking about myself. I'm standing on behalf of my wife's first husband. No, none of us are perfect. And none of us are going to be till we're in heaven with Jesus Christ. But until then, we have a wonderful opportunity every day we're alive to let Jesus in our boat and to let him take over and guide us as he would. Dear Father, we thank you that you even want to be with us. Lord, that you have a love for us and you present yourself to us in such a way as to invite us to allow you to become part of our lives. And Lord, as we have accepted you as Savior, Lord, I pray that we'll not only take you as Savior, but Lord, daily follow you as Lord and allow you access to every aspect of our lives. Lord, so that we may have those blessed as well. Lord, fill us with your goodness and use us in your kingdom. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.